recording Netflix and chill. What's that, that should be our new intro instead of Ralph, Ralph Wiggum. We need a new we need a new intro. That was supposed to be temporary and it's <laughs> over it half a year, enough. half a year temporary. That'll happen. Anyways, this is where I say welcome everybody to this week's episode of Nerd Flix and Chill, brought to you by We the Nerdy. I'm Gary Theroux, and over there is a guy who just told me that everything Liam Neeson has ever done would be better if he was replaced by Brendan Fraser. Uh, an odd choice. Well, I stand by my opinion, Gary. I think that we all learned exactly what Brendan Fraser was capable of as soon as he stood up to the world and said it's Fraser, not Fraser. That is a man with integrity and a backbone. I appreciate that. Well, it's Sean Capri, and Fucked I gotta up say, that I, couldn't money, good time. I couldn't disagree more. I think Schindler's List with Brendan Fraser grinning like an idiot would have been vastly <laughs> more uncomfortable. It would have made it. It would have made it more makeout worthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're gonna make out in Schindler's List, I mean, List. it couldn't get less makeout worthy. Brendan Fraser is pretty dreamy when he had his Tarzan bod. Mm -hmm. That was pretty mm -hmm. high end. He had that classic like little fluff, the little flare. Little little hairspray, but not too much hairspray. So would it also be good if the roles were reversed? Like if uh, Liam Neeson was in uh, Bedazzled with Elizabeth Hurley? Like mm. could he have played like becoming an NBA star? But oh my God, she tricked me! I have a tiny penis. Is that something? That, <laughs> <laughs> is that something that Liam Neeson? could handle i think it would just be no i think it actually make for a horrible horrible movie this doesn't go both ways even though i think logic really says it doesn't work either way but we're gonna go this way <laughs> i think it would be more just for our own entertainment just to see those movies take like this weird dark turn but only liam neeson is acting that way everybody else just continues on the same but liam neeson shows up <laughs> and does this whole like i have a special set of skills just broody and brooding and angry <laughs> <laughs> see, and I want to see, I want to see Brendan Fraser try and intimidate someone on the phone, because I just feel like he would end that like very special set of six skill speech with a "Okay, buddy." Okay. <laughs> He's got a certain Ashton Kutcher essence about him, I think. Well, and I, I, I don't know why I give him like what we, Canadian. What are we talking about, Gary? <laughs> For swapping Brendan Fraser and Liam Neeson, clearly this is an important film conversation that needs to be covered. I mean, I'm sure they're having these types of discussions at film schools all across the world. That's true. I and I, I have many, many of Brendan Fraser posters up on my wall. So I'm a obviously a huge fan. Who isn't a giant fan and knows Brendan Fraser's filmography inside and out? Yeah, I, I know you are the world's biggest fan of Blast from the oh Past. Oh my that's, god! That's... How do I get myself <laughs> into these situations? You asked me to host a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anyways. It is my fault. You're right. It is my fault. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Anyways, we have a very unique and special episode of uh, We the Nerdies, Nerdflix and Chill this week. We are going to talk about a new movie called Inferno that I'm going to give you. I'm going to try and do actual reviewing. And Sean, you can, you can chime in and ask me questions about my actual review as we go through it. Mm. That should be fun. Try a new format thing there. And then we're going to talk about The Incredibles. Usually, in this portion of the show, we would talk about the trailers we went and saw. We'll do the trailer talk segment. But none of the trailers for Inferno were things we hadn't already spoken about. That's a double negative. That's garbaggio. There were no new trailers in front of Inferno. So the trailer talk uh, segment this week will ex ex uh, exist or, or uh, entail only us covering the last entry in the month of October... Uh, and what was that, Sean? Clickety click click over to the spreadsheet. It was Inferno. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it came out last Friday. So it's the last Friday in October we're covering here. It's only Inferno, which uh, we're going to talk about today. And we've got the Rotten Tomato scores in front of us. Not very pretty. It came in from the critics at God damn percent So uh, I, I have an idea what that means, Sean. Why don't you tell us what we guessed for the purposes of the Rotten Tomato game? I hate this stupid game. Okay, let's get this over with. Inferno, we talked about this way back on episode 13, apparently. I took all these notes, so it's entirely possible that that was wrong. I've, that seems wrong, but who knows? <sighs> I should have known. I, I remember, I do remember talking about this with you, Gary, and I had no, I fell asleep in the first movie, Da Vinci Code. I didn't see the next one, but for some reason I was convinced this one was going to do it. You 
were right. I guessed 79, you guessed oh. 35, and the Rotten Tomato score comes in at a dismal 20. So that is all. The game Damn. is over. Do you so, want to do a quick recap on all these things? Do you want to do a, or do we just wrap it up with a final score on the month? Oh, sure, yeah. Take us through what October looked like and, and where my, my resounding victory came from. Because I think I was ahead coming into this last week. So what, yeah, what happened it was, to the month of October? This was this was a clincher for you. This I, I mean, obviously, we had a huge amount of separation. If I even came close, uh, it would have been it would have been a tight match. But you, you nailed the hammer into the nail that was into the coffin. <laughs> <laughs> so Oct- October was kind of a weird month. We had Inferno, Jack Reacher, The Girl on the Train, The Accountant, and Uja. And uh, let's see. Let's quickly go through. Jack Reacher, you and I both thought was going to be bad. That was, of course, your bang on 100%. You nailed it with 38. Girl on the Train, we were we thought it was going to be better. We both thought around the 70s. It came out in 44. Uh, I feel like a weatherman here. We got, we got an accountant coming in <laughs> and uh, a high of 50. And Uja was 81. So you ended up killing me. My total score was 169. You came in at 108. Still triple digits, so not the oh, best, damn. but yeah, better than terrible. Hard. All right. So that's uh, an October win for me. We've been playing this game for three months now. That's my second win. Sean's got one, so I don't think I have too much to brag about yet. But I love the fact that we're playing it. And we've got a bunch of reviews in the bank and guesses. Uh, I've already been second guessed uh, outside of the podcast by a friend of mine who I think I mentioned this last week, thinks we're high on, on uh, our thoughts on the next M. Night Shyamalan movie. Shyamalan. Uh, split. And, uh, yeah, I like to see how these things come in. I'm having a lot of fun with it. So that's awesome. So, yeah, no new entries to add to the game this week, though. Like I say, no new trailers in front of Inferno. So with that, we'll just jump right into uh, my review of Inferno. So uh, we're trying a new thing here where... Uh, we can't always go see every single movie for the rest of our lives. This podcast takes a lot of time out of the week. And, Sean, you're such a prolific podcaster that uh, we don't want you to get uh, burnt out. And we want the ability to bring in new hosts, like we can bring Thane back. We've got some other friends who might want to join us on here. And uh, we're going to try this new thing out. So how about you let me tell you about Inferno, Sean? Tell me, what what the hell is this, Gary? What is this Inferno movie? So Inferno is the third installment in Ron Howard and Tom Hanks' uh, trilogy based on the Dan, Dan Brown books, Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons, and now this. Um, in this entry, when Robert Langdon, who is Tom Hanks' character, wakes up in an Italian hospital with amnesia, everybody's favorite oh, movie. Oh, no. He teams up with Dr. Sienna Brooks, played here by uh, Felicity Jones, who I'm hoping will be much better than this in the upcoming Rogue One. And together they must race across Europe and race against the clock to foil a deadly plot. I have a question now that you're bringing up the fact that I'm racing over Europe. The question that is on everybody's mind, Gary, does this movie feature Jason Bourne cops? It does. It does. (laughs) It does, I believe, in the very beginning. Uh, when they might be in Italy or France, one of the two. I think you hear them approaching the scene uh, with the Jason Bourne. Style. That's how you know it's authentic. So, okay, we're off to a good start. We got the Europe cops. Plus, this will, I, I have to say, this is the first movie I've seen featuring uh, uh, shots, uh, settings in Europe since I got back from seeing Europe for the first time. Ah. And so I got that whole, hey, I've been there. You got the, uh, that sensation. douchey tourist, like, I've been there. Yeah, I had that, but I was I watched this movie at the theater. There's so usually more people. I had no one to use that shitty voice on it. That's your impression of me. I had no one to use that shitty voice on Not it. Not you. Myself. It's the proverbial <laughs> there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, back that one out. All right. So I just by way of an actual review of this thing, I would say that the one of the better things about this movie is the opening sequence. They kind of set the stakes it opens on ben foster's uh sort of villainous character and establishes the stakes of the movie right off the bat off the bat it's got an excellent opening sequence but it devolves almost immediately because of the amnesia angle so there's more flash imagery and confusion in the first 10 minutes than i think any person could tolerate like Mm -hmm. you think of uh like the blair witch project uh the original one with all the the vibrating cameras and everything like that that annoyed people the tropes here, the direction of like uh, Tom Hanks uh, has been in some type of incident and he's confused and he's seeing things. 
they really hammer that thing down to a point that's uncomfortable as if you were like, we get it. He's not of sound mind and body here. Mm -hmm. Let's move on and start this story. So uh, it started off sort of weak in that sense, even though it had that that great opening sequence. If you take the first 15 minutes as a segment, it it ends up kind of hurting itself at that point. So from there, they move on to the establishment of the puzzle. These movies are essentially about a mystery, a puzzle that gets laid out, and you spend the movie solving it. And I think people who enjoyed the first couple entries will find stuff to enjoy here within the puzzle. So uh, there's some characters that maybe are a little uh, uh, too on the nose. Uh, they've created like a... Uh, you made the Jason Bourne Sirens reference earlier. Mm-hmm. They have a, an Italian... I called her the enti- Italian RCMP Treadstone agent <laughs> because... <laughs> She's got, She's like chasing after Robert Langdon. You don't know whose side she's on. She's very focused and robotic in the way that she's going to follow them and notice them at the far side of a crowd. But in the meantime, she's like this official Italian cop wearing the sash and shit like that and riding on her motorcycle. Oh my god, that's amazing. I don't know if that brings up the imagery I'm hoping to bring up when I say Italian RCMP or Treadstone agent. <laughs> I, think it, I think it's like perfect. Okay, well, I hope I hope if nothing else, people when they see that movie and see her, will know exactly what I'm talking about. But do people really need to see it? Is this like is this a cautionary tale that you got for us, Gary? Yeah, Are you with ultimately, the Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, ultimately, at the end of this review, uh, I am going to come around to a point where I kind of say an ultimately forgettable two out of five. Uh, our Rotten Tomatoes scores, like you say, twenty percent from critics, forty three percent from fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, I think I'm with the fans here. It's not aggressively bad. It's not painful or anything like that. But just uh, not a whole lot to grab onto. And not a whole lot uh, memorable is the main thing, right? So there was a... This movie contains sort of an eye roll of a twist, Mm. if ever there was one. Like, M. Night Shyamalan would be proud of the, the, oh my goodness, really, that's what you're going with moment people have when there's a twist in this? Mm -hmm. But. I think that by way of complimenting the movie, I would say that Tom Hanks is so reliable and consistent as an actor, you know what you're going to get out of him. I think of him as like the Honda Civic of actors. Like just, he's, he's, a smart he's choice. what he is. Yeah, exactly. A mm-hmm. sensible choice to lead your, your international uh, franchise of movies, right? There is also, by way of complimenting, a very unique character. Nothing can be very unique that's grammatically incorrect. There is a unique character uh in all the thrillers I've ever seen that breathes extra life into the story in the middle that, that kind of drags without him. And it's mm-hmm. expertly played by an actor called Irfan Khan, who plays, um, like I say, a fly in the ointment, an unexpected character in this movie that you feel uh, is so full of tropes. Like, I don't know if you feel mm-hmm. after seeing the trailer and having a little bit of knowledge of the se- series, like, you know exactly what you're going to get here. And that's why you don't feel the need to go see a movie yeah. like this. Well, yeah, and I wanted to ask you about just sort of the stakes, I guess. Like, does it seem like the world is in peril or it always my the reason I fell asleep in the first one is it seemed like the world really wasn't coming to an end. It didn't seem like it was just like, well, we'll go discover some stuff. We'll follow some clues and everything will probably be fine. Did you get a sense in this movie that like everything was just going to be tickety boo? Well, see, here's the thing. It's established because Tom Hanks is so good at what he does that it's just like. Except it's almost too good. Well, plus he is, I mean, when you center the story around him, you've got that the whole, whole sort of uh, uh, story making or storytelling tentpole where you kind of have an idea of how the three acts of this movie are going to go. Right. So it's not a spoiler to say that the what the stakes are. It, it's spelled out in the trailer. Ben right. Foster's character is sort of a billionaire uh, sort of um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg surrogate who wants to help the world with his billions. But he decides that the problem with the world is overpopulation. What he needs to do is cull the population. So he invents a virus that will kill half of the world's population. Mm-hmm. And through that, he's one of these virtuous villains who thinks that through that, the rest of us will prosper. Uh, and Robert Langdon is the one who's, who's sort of uh, pitted against him and, and, and attempting to foil his plot, right? Mm-hmm. So the problem, again, is the conventionality of this movie and – the the fact that if you've watched any number of Hollywood thrillers over the last few years, let alone the two previous entries in the series, you kind of could 
could write this movie yourself. The beats are something you would expect. So I would say that the, the international settings in all of Europe that we were talking about is beautifully shot. Yeah. And, and Howard does a good job of keeping the story chugging along steadily, even though there's no real sense of a building momentum, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but the inevitability of the conclusion, what you're talking about, the inevitability of the story and, and, and how it's going to play out kind of strips the final act of any sense of urgency that, mm -hmm. that someone might have. Yeah. Although maybe you and I can dismiss that not to undercut my own point, but do you think guys like you and I who watch a ton of movies could dismiss that as someone, as something that only people in review mode would notice? I don't know if you still allow yourself to sort of go along for the ride uh, with a movie like this that's just supposed to be a couple hours of mindless entertainment. I mean, I guess so, but like when a movie like this is kind of based on a book, you'd hope that the writing would be better, that the that the that the narrative would be a little stronger. So. In a way, yes, I think that probably applies to maybe more like a movie like The Accountant. But this one, it seems like there should be a little bit more substance. But instead, and maybe this talks about just how popular the book series is. It's just, it's very, um, I don't know, soccer mom-ish. This is something that so many people pick up and it's easy to digest and it doesn't really challenge you in a whole lot of ways. And I think that translates, it seems pretty naturally onto the screen where you're not really challenged in any way it's just here's tom hanks he's mr america we all love him he's america's dad and it's just fine there's nothing aggressively bad about it like batman v superman fuck that movie uh, but there's <laughs> <laughs> but like it's not really that smart either so i feel like that's a lot of 2016 but i'm that's enough of my rambling on that um i'm well, glad you got a funny. chance to see it well, and and I'm I'm glad you didn't because, like I say, it, it just it's so forgettable. And the, uh -huh. and after what you just said, the insights you had for someone who's only seen the trailer, it's exactly right. Yeah, you, it's like you were there, and and it's because of how sort of paint by numbers this story is. Yeah. So I know I can tell you I've There's read an audience all for three of the thing. books exactly. Yeah, I've read all three of the books. This was by far the most rushed. Like we have a franchise now, so I'm going to knock out a third one. I don't know if you had as much source material for this. Um, it just, it is the weakest in terms of density and entry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and I think that mm -hmm. comes through on the screen. So, uh, definitely a forgettable entry. I would say skip it. Uh, if people are still using this for recommendations, uh, it's not something that requires your time. Like I said, a two out of five for this movie and, uh, definitely a good choice for your first movie to not make it to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two, uh, one star per Tom Hanks eyeball. Yes. There you go. So with that said, that gives us plenty of time to discuss this week's Six Degrees of Chill entry, which was The Incredibles, uh, starring the voice work of Craig T. Nelson and Holly Hunter and others. Why don't you tell us about The Incredibles, Sean? Oh my gosh, Gary. I am a little unorganized here because I thought we were going to do some Tom Hanks lists. Um, oh my goodness, I completely forgot. Do you Let's still want to do that? Everything. Do you want to do, you want to do that? I, I apologize. There's no Let's... way for me to like secretly transmit this thought. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way for us to edit this at all. It has to be one giant audio log, and I'm not just going to draw more attention oh. to the fact that I'm not editing it by just <laughs> talking about how I'm not going to edit it. A window into the lack of professionalism over at Nerdflix and Chill Studios. <laughs> the window has been wide open, and there's not even a screen door. Talk about so before we get the Incredibles. We'll call that a tease. That was on purpose. Ooh. We're going to talk about The Incredibles soon. But first, because of the no trailers this week and stuff like that, we thought we'd treat you guys to a Nerdflix and chill list. We're going to do this one on the fly. It's top five Tom Hanks movies. So I'm curious. We're sort of going through this on IMDb. What jumps out of you from his uh, filmography there, Sean? Okay. I don't think I'm going to do this in order. I did the last one in order. Maybe we'll figure out in a bit here. The first one that... Uh, catches my attention from a list of Tom Hanks movies is Catch Me If You Can with Wait. the adorable Leonardo DiCaprio. Adorable is what you're going to go <laughs> with? All words? All right. In that yeah, movie, I think so. I think I think there, that was a turning point in his, in his look, in his demeanor. He sort of just went from, I'm going to be this carefree guy, going to fly some planes and pretend to be people I'm not. And then he got taken under the, the darkness that is the Martin Scorsese uh, wing, under his wing and he's sort of adopted all of the different facial features like the eyebrow I don't even know what the hell I'm talking about I love Catch Me If You Can the rewatchability factor on this movie I think 
through the roof, Gary. Yeah. I can watch this movie at any. I can watch it morning, day, night, on the toilet, when I'm at my mother in law's, what if I'm on the bus, going to a ski trip. All of this talking has nothing to do with the movie. Are it's you a great choice? Are you in an agreement? <laughs> great choice. Catch Me Can is definitely going to make my on the fly top five list. So what else you got? Okay, we also got. We talked about this not too long ago. Apollo thirteen. Yep. This guy can be an FBI agent, Tom Hanks, or he could be an astronaut. And I love me some some Apollo thirteen. Uh, I got me some Saving Private Ryan. Of course, three for three so far. Okay. This is one that I wasn't even sure um, didn't come to mind until I and I it's only because you don't see him but you hear him in Toy Story. And I have a and lot. Of, is sorry. it Toy Story one for you? We've done this before with when we rank Pixar movies. Yeah, I think Toy but Story one to, is my top. Is your number one? Okay. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't make my list. Oh. Would I'm, would be outside my top five, but I'm that's only because I've never seen the the next two. And my memories of Toy Story aren't as vivid as they should be. It needs to come up in uh, 6 DOC for me to watch it again. Okay. See, and I think that I'm I'm kind of in the newer age of Tom Hanks. I know some people are throwing up, like, Forrest Gump, and we are talking just before we started the show, that that movie is the most random POS. I don't know. Like, I don't think I've ever done a, such a 180 on a movie that I have since uh, watching Forrest Gump just recently. That movie's a big pile of crap. Gary, <laughs> Thank it God, is so, so random. I don't think it's bad, right? We were having this. I've, we've been having this conversation uh, with some of our friends for quite a while now. Someone brought it up one night when we were mm-hmm. all out having a few drinks that like, Morris Gump is an all-time top ten great movie, right? And I vehemently disagree with that yeah. it is by no means that i love that someone is on the dark side of, of forrest gump though because i don't think it's very good at all mm-hmm. i don't think it's painfully bad but for someone to put it on an all-time list i think what did you say about it just the the, the complete randomness of it the the lack of a through line let's see if like, i can try if i can try this again <laughs> it's like like a five-year-old telling you about their day yes that was it <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Sean. Uncle hey, Sean. hey, hey, Gary. Hey, Gary. So, like, first, Forrest is he's <laughs> he's disabled, but then he's like totally not. And not only is he not, he can like run really fast, and then he just keeps running. And then in college, there's this time where he, he plays football, but he's really dumb, but it's cool because he's run really fast and he just keeps running through the <laughs> crowd. And they all tell him to stop, and he doesn't. But then the next time they do it, they tell him to stop, and then he stops. And then he's in the army, and then he's fighting in <laughs> Vietnam. And then it explodes. Uh, there's these explosions, and he's with Lieutenant Dan and his and his friend Bubba, and they don't sleep in the rain. And then Lieutenant Dan loses his <laughs> his his legs, and he wants to die, but Forrest doesn't let him die. And then um, Jenny gets AIDS or cancer or something, and she um, is a high, and she's gonna jump off the the ledge, and she's gonna kill herself, but she she doesn't, and she comes back, and she makes up with Forrest, and Forrest and them are like boyfriend and girlfriend and peas and carrots and then they're not and then she leaves again and then sally field is his mom and she like totally um she she's alive but then she dies and um he's also he also he also plays ping pong and he's really good at it and he also buys apple stock and gets rich off of it and then later he is a shrimp captain and then also um Lieutenant Dan jumps in the lake and he swims and then it's over and then every, his mom and, and Jenny die because she was a <laughs> slut when she was younger. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh my goodness. And it was really good. Oh my <laughs> Best God. movie ever. Thank you. I have to personally thank you for that. Holy shit. <laughs> oh. Wow. So what you're saying is, Sean, if I can... <laughs> If I can put a button on all of that, uh, Tom uh, Forrest Gump, not in your top five Tom Hanks movies, is what you're saying. Yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's above all those. It's my number. <laughs> no, it's like, how do you how do you refute that? It is irrefutable that that description. Okay, so I agree with you. Oh I can't. God, we have to try and find a way to put this back on the rails after that and make sense of all this. My head hurts from laughing so much. <laughs> um, okay, so we agree. On three, you said Toy Story. You said definitely not Forrest Gump. So what would be your fifth that okay, is what have I said so far? Catch Me If You Can, Apollo 13, Saving Private Ryan, Toy, Toy Story. Story. These are the four that I feel very strongly about. Um, 
I feel like my fifth spot could be so many different things. Let's go eeny, meeny, miny. You know what? I'm going to give it to Captain Phillips because of that. The scene at the end gets me every time. I've seen this movie a few times since it's come out. I've referenced it. It's not the best reference when I when I tell you that I'm the captain now. Uh, but that scene at the end when he, when he finally like kind of comes to grips with what happened and the nurse or whoever it is, is helping him and he like, he's now safe. And it's just when it, like when a grown up when a dad cries, oh my God. And he, that gets me even just thinking about it. That scene gives me chills. I'm going to give my fifth spot to Captain Phillips. Not a bad pick at all. Wouldn't make my list. I I, I won't take the, the time to order my list. I would just say. Those first three of Catch Me If You Can, Apollo 13, and Saving Private Ryan would definitely be on mine. Mm -hmm. The next two slots, rather than Toy Story and Captain Phillips, for me would go to one of my favorite movies from when I was a kid, A League of Their Own. Uh, Ah. Tom Hanks uh, peeing acting is some of the best acting in the world. Nobody pisses on film like Tom Hanks pisses on film. Nobody! This is probably his debut as a world-class pisser, although he does excellent urinary work in the green mile (laughs) he does excellent urinary work in apollo 13 he's just he's a top drawer pisser Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh the other one is something that maybe wouldn't be on a ton of people's lists uh i look for reasons to put this movie on every year or two whenever i remember that i really love this movie what we call charlie wilson's war oh Um, totally underrated philip seymour hoffman is in fact the tits uh uh tom hanks is excellent in it Philip Seymour Hoffman is excellent in it. I like Amy Adams and Julia Roberts as well. It's just, it's a really, really good movie. And, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to nice. get some shaming for not being a huge Toy Story fan here. But I'm I'm happy with my list of five. I like I like these lists, Gary. This is a lot of fun. I think we're going to have well, to chop out that little Forrest Gump description and share it on the Please, dear ones. God, never. Yeah, yes, do that. Don't. I thought you were going to chop it out. No, nope. this episode. Nope. There's is, no editing. There's only ah, there's only betterment that happens. This is a freaking high point of my week, I will tell you that. So <sighs> Well, I'm uh, lightheaded because of it. I don't know yeah. how kids breathe so much. So now I'm excited to watch uh Tom Hanks entries, and I would love it if he was the connection in next week's Six Degrees of Chill and watch any of those movies that you and I mentioned. Indeed. But we don't know what it's gonna be yet. First we gotta talk about this week's Six Degrees of Chill, which surprise, surprise is The Incredibles, as mentioned before, and I'm wondering <laughs> if you have anything you can tell us about this wonderful Pixar film show. What an amazing movie. It came out 12 years ago, almost to the day, November 5th, 2004, if my math is correct. Uh, directed by Brad Bird, probably his best work here, um, and did actually very well at the box office. We'll get to that. In just a second, we have Craig T. Nelson, Holly Hunter, Samuel L. Jackson, Jason Lee, which, what an amazing performance by Jason Lee. We'll get to that in a second, too. Um, this movie was made for about $92 million. It grossed $261 million. I have to I have to think that this would do actually even better now. Um, 260, like, that's a good, pretty good ratio. But I have to imagine that, like, with all the superhero movies that have come out ever since and... Um, People look back on this movie as we are going to do today with with very rose tinted glasses. Uh, just a phenomenal film. I'm so glad that we got a chance to go back and look at this. Um, I don't see any. I'm going to get oopsed or something on this. I don't see anything for awards. I feel like that's impossible. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, that strikes me as odd because it's just so wildly popular, especially with guys of our generation. How is that right? possible? We're at a point. Uh, we were uh, maybe in college age when this came out, so it's kind of not meant for us it's supposed to be Mm -hmm. a kids movie but you hear great things right uh rotten tomatoes wasn't necessarily a thing then but you knew the critical response was through the roof for these pixar movies 97 percent on rotten tomatoes as of today but a very surprising 75 from fans and i just we talk about this a lot when we see some of these fan numbers who is the person who sees the incredibles and goes no not for me not for me yeah like just i just don't get it if nothing else, it's a wildly enjoyable time at the movies. I am surprised to hear it didn't win awards because it was so well received. But, yeah, I'm like double uh, checking. Like, I don't see it anyway. Sorry, that wasn't. Yeah, it, it absolutely is staggering. Right? Yeah, um, nope. I'd like to see really, what else was up for awards back in 2004. Then that this got snubbed. Much, I think it would have been before because Toy Story 3 was the first uh, legitimate Best Picture nomination for an animated feature, right? 
for uh, one of these, yeah, since Pixar like kind the of Disney yeah, that's true. Era, that's true. Yeah, right? that's a good point. And just maybe they hadn't broke through yet. So if it, if something else won Best Animated that year because there was mm-hmm. a, uh, I don't know, some some other Disney entry that that was non Pixar because I know they 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 put so few movies out relative to the years that uh, that that could be why. So mm-hmm. anyways, the ninety seven percent for me is right where I'm going to end up. So for those of you who are just joining us on a six degree segment. This is where we talk about a movie from our pasts, from our DVD collections, from Netflix or an on-demand service, and we talk about the beginning and the middle and the end, and we spoil the entire thing, and, and we hope you watched along with us, and if not, we hope we can talk you through it, like we just got out of the theater watching it, and you'll know exactly what happened, and you won't have to spend the two hours to do it, as I did last night from the hours of 1 a.m. to 3 oh, no, a.m., because movie watching at this point has become like homework, but homework that I very much like, unlike in high school. You, you just trade not. sleep for it. Yeah, exactly. I have time for sleep or movies, and yeah, sometimes you just a guy get it done. And like, I love movies. did you find? Okay, so let's talk about your little your watching experience. At one in the morning. This movie is so I think well paced that it actually be all right to watch at one in the morning. Oh, it flew by. I was yeah. shocked, right? Because I thought, man, it must be getting late because this movie's almost over. And I looked and I was like, holy shit, it has. It's been 80 minutes. Yep. And I still feel like I'm in the middle of this this chugging adventure like this mm-hmm. with so much. I talked about the, the lack of momentum and, and, and building uh, momentum in Inferno. This is the exact opposite, mm-hmm. right? This is constantly rising towards a crescendo that you were eager to get in on, right? So um, I the- just think... I'm going to jump, I'm gonna jump in, Gary, and say that yeah. the reason that this movie, I think so highly of it is because it manages to be an origin story and a full-on like monster, like kind of an episode or monster of the week kind of story all in one. Something that yeah. we've seen superhero movies fail at time and time again. We have a family, uh, a, grow- a budding family, actually. We-, we learn that the Incredibles are four, actually five family members who um, have special abilities and early in the movie we have superheroes across the land denounced and because they're they're deemed to be causing more harm than good so they're forced to go into hiding and it's this hiding of the special abilities that causes some I don't know repressed energy and and Mr. Incredible has to just get out he but he throws his boss through the wall and he has to get out and then is um and then he is discovered to uh... <laughs> So did you speaking of of you're setting up the 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 premise of the movie there mm. and I'm just curious when you talk about the 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 introduction and the way that they get right to business and and sort of montage their way through the era of superheroes and then the lawsuits that cause them to go into hiding did you like I did forget about those little intro videos those dated intro videos interviews at the beginning yes of course it's so perfect it just there's no opening credits there's no nothing it just pops open there's like the it's like an old film we're introduced to the characters about like their mannerisms and their names it's very kind of very simple it's a very easy way for us to go oh that's mr incredible oh that's elastigirl and that's frozone um and we get to know them just just a, a quick little snippet of this kind of like behind the curtain, what they feel about the current situation. I thought that was really clever. This whole movie just drips and oozes with style from those little scenes to the music and everything. Just has a just a ton of, I don't know, just personality. Is yeah, what it has. definitely. It's what I found about that is so I like. It was surprising, mm. like you say. Uh, you you step into the theater and you're expecting um, maybe like a Lion King like we're going to establish a story with a voiceover <laughs> and like animation within the animation, Rafiki drawing the, mm-hmm. the, the premise of the movie on a cave wall. It's just so direct mm-hmm. and, and, and timely, I think at, uh, of 2004 for them to sort of have this mockumentary style. I mean, the yes, office is yes. at the height of its power. Yes. It's just so appropriate for these characters and sets the tone in the way that it's going to be self-aware and sort of self-effacing in certain places mm-hmm. when they talk about tropes. I love later on when they continue to talk about, oh, the bad guy started monologuing. I couldn't believe it. Yes. Like, it's not, you know what I mean? Like, it's just so self-aware and mm-hmm. smart in terms mm-hmm. of its if it's styling. And we notice it in the first three minutes, like you just said. It's I, this is this is where I get to sound like an old man talking about the good old days, but. I don't think that Pixar has this swagger any longer. I don't think that they have this creativity anymore. Um, 
this was just no holds barred. Just make a movie that is commentary on so many different things. And at the very surface level, it's a commentary on uh, superhero movies of super powered and super just super people they actually just base it down like bake it down to it to the word super in this but ultimately there's layers in here it's about midlife crisis and family and people being special and who's getting credit and be, like be careful what you wish for type of situations so i'm curious you mentioned family and and relationships and all that mm. so ostensibly here what you were getting to when you're going through the induction i mean the story is about syndrome this buddy that comes back into mr incredible's life and and gets turned into a villain by getting shut away uh and then he develops this plan where he's going to terrorize the world with a robot of his own invention and then come back and save them and thereby become a superhero himself um and he wants to break down the walls of the actual idea of, of heroism and and being super with that as the template mm -hmm. do you think that watching it again now the adult themes were were handled right. Was it too much of it? Was it too little of it? I couldn't believe how much talk of of infidelity and 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 boredom and what how much it sucks to be an adult and be in the real world. Yes, and, and sort of how how adult the themes were. Definitely, that's and that's why I love watching these movies. From well, they're not these were were kind of in our teens when when this came out. So I don't know if we necessarily watched this through like children's eyes, but it definitely feels nostalgic in that way that it's like a movie that we watched when we were kids and now watching it a little older you can definitely understand that if you had super strength and you were restrained by the monotony of a, of a desk job you would go absolutely crazy you would try to find every chance you could to sneak out with your buddies to listen to police scanners or even at, like at the very worst start being a superhero again like you you totally understand that meanwhile the wife is at home making sure that the family is still just survival. Like you're just trying to get by, trying to put, put food on the table, not necessarily providing, but just like keeping the house in order. And she has clearly made the choice of, uh, like Elastigirl has clearly made the choice that she is now a mom, but Mr. Incredible just has that, that itch that he's got to scratch every once in a while. And ultimately leads us to this, to this adventure. I think this movie is so clever I'm actually having trouble to decipher exactly all the things that are super clever about it. The line that they go back to, I, um, if everybody is special, then nobody is. I feel like that's such an advanced line for what is ostensibly is a family movie, like with a large audience being for kids. I feel like this is that's a line that is directed for adults because it's a real thinker that... If everybody well, yeah, is, if we're saying that. everybody's amazing, then like what makes anybody unique? And it's a really profound, like, you, I feel like you just don't get that in Disney movies anymore. It's almost like a lesson to parents of like, you can't make every, you can't give everybody participation medals. Yeah, that's the thing. Is it, early 2000s, it is and, and has continued to be a big theme, the backlash towards that, uh, that uh, no ranking culture of ours, right? Where you can't have, MVPs in sports and you have to right. have participation in this. And, and I don't know how much of that is true and how much of that is driven by how much we hear those stories in pop culture because mm -hmm. that's a theme that comes up in a lot of shows and a lot of non-fiction. You watch the news and stuff like that. I hear a lot of people bitching about that culture, yeah. right? That you get this backlash where people say, no, you have to earn everything, right? So anyways, I don't want to get diverted, sure, sure. diverge off that too much. I just want to say that you're right in the sense that that is yet another real world sort of adult theme, mm -hmm. a real thinker for the people who are who are over a certain age, right? I think the target audience isn't focusing on that. They're focusing on the adventure. They're focusing mm -hmm. on Dash and his super speed and they're they're focusing yes. on how it's how it's funny and relatable, the the dy dynamic that he has with Violet, his sister and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And and the kids are loving this, and, and I think all of this other stuff might have been meant for us. It might have been meant for the people who are taking the kids to the movie or watching it for the fun of movie going as, as a whole. You know what I mean? Um, but what I think the, the, one of the best things you can say about this movie is is how it strikes a balance between those two things. How it does stand up on its own merits as a movie that is just a fun action adventure that makes use of the fact that it's in an animated world. The superhero powers are somehow in this construct super 
believable and and I love the way they do that comic book version of uh, building uh, their superhero powers into their personality as well. Big time. So so uh, Elastigirl isn't just flexible. In actuality, her personality is uh, that who's pliable and trying to make everybody happy. And she has she to be. She's a mom. She's adaptable, yeah. And, and you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he's bullheaded and through the wall thinking and personality as well. He it has just, dad strength. He absolutely does. And it's just, it's it's fun is what it is. It's, it's children's filmmaking at its highest combined with great writing for the it's people who are going to be taking smart. those kids in there. It is insanely smart. Every like the whole family dynamic is built. It's a, it's a very typical type of family with the three kids and the parents. And then yeah, you talked about the powers of the parents and then the hyper son who who runs around too fast. That's just a it's a hyperbolic sort of reflection of what a, what an actual family is. You have the the daughter who is very kind of emo and introverted. She's to herself, so she just wants to hide from the world. She can disappear. Like this is every character is so well fleshed out from their their. Design like how they look their their age in the family like the um it's just oh, gary i'm tripping over myself here it's so perfect and jack has this mystery jack jack has has these mystery powers that we find at the end it's just so so clever and this is what we're missing from movies these days yeah and i think a lot of times when we talk about a movie we both enjoyed this much and we skip the part where we we give our scores in advance but i think people can tell where it's going and we'll get to it at the end but we all, we kind of say, oh, well, we have to come up with a flaw now. We've spent too much time washing this movie's balls. We have to come up with a flaw. But I really don't feel that need here because we haven't even gotten to the fact of how uh, well-placed all of the, the comic relief mm-hmm. and the timing of the, the direction of Brad Bird here is. I mean, I really enjoyed throw-ins like the kid on the tricycle. <laughs> right? I don't know, waiting for something amazing <laughs> or something. Yeah, exactly. He's, just, he's brilliant, right? And it's mm-hmm. it's it's a serious movie. It's dark, right? When when Mr. Incredible has to sit through a mugging while his boss berates him. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a dark, dark scene, right? <laughs> like it's just it's ugly at certain points. And and that direction by Bird to to keep us moving along. What I found was one of the next mo- notes I made was Every part of this movie, for some reason, even the bad stuff, is endearing, mm-hmm. right? Because even when things are going badly, you're sympathizing with the the character, the main character on screen. Like you just you feel a part of it. And I find myself watching a movie like this, sort of constantly with a bit of a, a, a goofy grin on my face, yeah. right? Like a like a small kid watching a fireworks show or, a, or an air show. Something amazing is happening on screen, and that's how I felt when we were going through the action sequences. And the comedy that landed in every place, mm-hmm. Edna Mode, and and her her studio and and everything like that. Just was it racist? The com- that the Taylor Edna was, Mode. It was it was it was she? What, what nationality do you think she was? I was gonna say it definitely can't be because I have no idea what nationality that character is supposed to be. She. I watched this movie with Chelsea. And she reminded us of the Taylor that she had that um, adjusted her wedding dress and. She reminded us of the, the phone call that she made where she gave her a couple months in advance, but the response was, oh, no, you don't give enough time. Okay, no, you come in on Thursday. And it was like, that's Edna. That's amazing. Right? I just love it. <laughs> I did I did not get that Asian? sense. Right do here. I do not think she's Asian. I think she's playing Euro trash, and she's doing it fantastically oh, well. I, I love that we're song. saying she, this is because that was actually Brad Bird, right? Oh, that's hilarious. Doing Edna's voice. It just... But like I say, as a comic relief, mm-hmm. as an injection of of humor into this movie that maybe in those moments had started to go a little too dark, right? Mm-hmm. The mix of it is just so so well found. It, it, it's and it kind of makes Bird in this case, especially with an am- animated movie, not relying so much on an actor to carry the feeling that your audience is having. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's like having a really good chef, and he's just got the right proportions of everything, right? He's, Definitely. He's not, doesn't put too much of any one thing to overpower the others because if it is about adventure for you, you don't. I don't think there's too much lull here. And if it is about family and story, I don't think there's any points in this movie where you're thinking, okay, get on with it, right? Mm-hmm. And if it's about humor, I don't think there's any point where you think, hey, I thought this was supposed to be a comedy. It's just it's quality through and through, and uh, I think we can fit in at least 
between 10 and 90 more minutes of ball watching for this movie. <laughs> okay, I'm going to throw one more thing in. I think okay. that a, a, a true... A sign of true quality in a movie or a st- or storytelling in general, this applies to video games, movies, books, whatever, is if you're while, – while you're experiencing it, you get the sense that there's something more than what is being presented. And what I mean by that is that there's a universe there, that there's something if you were to peel back the layers, you could have a full-on story about syndrome. You could have a full-on story about any one of the characters within the family. You could have a story about that, like, you could start to, like, imagine an extended universe, but yep. they don't throw it at you hand over fist. It's not, oh, and by the way, we should really dive into what Syndrome was talking about when he said he was selling off technology to warring countries in the world. They just drop a line in there. It drives the story forward it makes sense and it kind of goes in line with the character that he is it pushes him to the point where where we finally meet up with him in the future while when he's an adult like that's just one example but this movie it's it's in there throughout so i get the feeling that there's a lot more here but but there's a lot of restraint shown of and confidence that this is all we needed to be shown to be entertained for two hours straight so that's the last thing that i'm going to say before saying this is a five out of five for me um best one of the best if not the best superhero made of all time and i feel like just nothing can even come close to introducing new characters and executing all at the same time ball washing complete <laughs> well I, okay i'm gonna give it a five out of five as well it was my number one pixar movie i absolutely love this yep. movie um the last thing i want to say is less part of review more just i wanted to ask you about one of my favorite scenes in the movie which is how do you when pick? he comes back from when he comes back from his first mission, Mister Incredible, he goes to the the island before he's met Syndrome and knows what's going on. He destroys, I think, version nine mm-hmm. of the Om- Omnidroid. Comes home refreshed and reinvigorated with his his pay, and we go on a montage. Yep. And in this family animated comedy, Mister Incredible gets so much pussy. Oh, he's constantly going to the gym and. Losing weight and then coming home mm-hmm. and crushing the wife and then buying her <laughs> new things and buying himself a new car. I was just like, how are you showing this? Are you just assuming kids have no idea what's going on? It tricks, it tricks to be the adults into thinking, the adult? is, wait, is Mrs. Incredible hot? <laughs> she's, she's not Jester Rabbit hot, I know that. But she's a cartoon. <laughs> I'm so conflicted. <laughs> And then you come to realize, yes, of course she is, and you shouldn't be conflicted at all. It's perfectly normal. (laughs) Uh, What I want to know is, is Frozone's wife hot? Because she's giving him quite a bit of fucking lip from off screen. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you, you just sounds she's, like Medea. She's you're got an ass Tyler that goes Perry. on for days, Gary. <laughs> yeah, she, mm-hmm. she's got she's got a muumu. You're picturing uh, Tyler Perry just with, with rollers in her hair, just <laughs> screaming at him that she put his suit away, even mm-hmm. though he's got a storage place for it. That is where it's supposed to be put away. Yep. Yeah, no, she is the greatest good that he'll ever experience. Yeah, exactly. It's little moments like that that I absolutely love. I mean, there's other movies we've gone through scene by scene, but honestly, we couldn't have done that here because Frozone could have had like a Disney afternoon spin-off cartoon. Absolutely, could have been merchandised on its own, right? There's mm-hmm. no scene here where you couldn't just That's exactly right. Make a half-hour Saturday morning cartoon about Edna Mode tailored to the superhero community and do episodes of the week with like why she's so against capes, mm-hmm. right? Like it mm-hmm. just oh, so at the capes, no capes. How could I forget? So incredible. <laughs> exactly. There's no just pun intended. So many that was moments awful. like that, that that sort of jump off the screen at you. And 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 like I say, the main thing for me is at no point in this movie am I not having fun. So I'm curious um, if anyone could have watched this and even listened to what we're saying here and said, ah, I I can't believe they didn't mention this part that I didn't particularly love. Um, I, I just don't know what it could be. Is it maybe a little too uh, simplistic and easy to digest? I mean, they talk about monologuing and being self-aware, and then Syndrome kind of details his master plan in animated form uh, for uh, for Mr. Well, Incredible. Movie, don't do computer. that. I don't even give show. people that. Don't give people that. Because what <laughs> makes one movie bad doesn't make another movie bad. This is done so and executed so perfectly. No, stop. It's earned the currency to 100% maybe be a little it. simple. Yeah, I think I think I and agree. And then with that. some. All right, so that's our review of The Incredibles. Five out of five from both of us. We hope you watched ahead of time this week. 
But if nothing else, like, what was that, 25 minutes of Sean and I telling you that this is one of the best things ever put on film? Uh, Just absolutely, yeah, buffing in a Mm -hmm. karate kid-like circular motion. The the collective balls of Craig T. Nelson, Holly Hunter, and Brad Bird. Um, Yeah, I think, I think, I hope everybody enjoyed this as much as we did. And I'm enjoying this segment more than anything else. I just love seeing what's going to come up next. We went from The Firm, a 1980s legal thriller starring Gene Hackman and Tom Cruise, (laughs) to The Incredibles. So, I know we got a bunch of contributors uh, this week. You guys are amazing. I can't thank you enough for those of you contributing on Facebook and on Twitter and in other places. Thank you so much. Sean, what do we got going on on the Six Degrees of Chill randomizer for next week? This might be a new record, Gary. We had just a ton of submissions and tons of shares. Antonio Guillen, welcome back with your totally insane connections like Casino Royale and his connection is that it's a Bond slash spy movie. Uh, cool. Corey Gilmer. And we definitely, from, sorry. We definitely picked, we definitely picked him, right? Cause we have teachers pets and he complimented us on Facebook. That is true. Uh, but ultimately I'm sorry, Antonio to, to burst your bubble here. Your movies did not get picked. He also threw in the Watchmen cause it was a superhero connection. Um, everybody else followed the rules. So that was great. We have, <laughs> <laughs> we have every, people like Chris O'Neill and Matt Foti came up with mall rats, Josh Stapleton with Jurassic park. Of course, uh, hold on to your butts, everybody. Uh, Toy Story, and Tony, you nailed that one. So thank you for that. Uh, Blair Hamilton with The Negotiator. Gosh, man, uh, Thane with Jane and Silent Bob Strike Back. Just a phenomenal bunch of movies. I was looking forward to pretty much all of these, except for the winner, which I have no idea what this movie is. Gary, you can tell me if this is good. It comes from our good friend Matt Foti. He won probably most likely because he shared Double Up His Chances with... Turner and Hooch. Really? We're watching Turner and Hooch. What the hell wow. is Turner and Hooch? Uh, Tom Hanks and a dog in an 80s buddy cop movie. Uh, this is going to be fucking great. <laughs> I just Do looked wanna... at the post. I just Googled it and just saw the poster. <laughs> Do you want me to look up the Rotten Tomato scores in advance? No, I don't want to know in advance. No, Should I don't think so. <laughs> Oh I, just, oh, I just saw it. Stupid Google and giving me all the information I need about a movie all at once. <laughs> it's, oh, this is an 80s classic, 1989. Don't throw a word the, the cl- classic around like that. On the old internets. I remember absolutely loving this movie, but I have to admit, I probably haven't seen it since 1995-ish uh, on VHS Great. rental from my local video store. Uh, so... This is why this game was invented. You know what? I don't I know why you're say, such a mm-hmm. fucking sourpuss. Mm-hmm. This nope. is why we decided to do this. I'm hemming it up a little bit. Come on. Who, who, who ever would have, in November of 2016, been like, you know what I want to watch? <laughs> Turner and fucking Hooch. <laughs> Matt Foti. No one would ever say that. So because of us and because of the show and mostly because of Matt Foti, we hope you do. I'm going to demand it. First, I'm going to go on Netflix, search for it. I'm They're going to tell now. me we don't have this. Then I'm going to go to my DVD collection and be like, of course I don't own fucking Turner and Hooch. Who owns Turner and Hooch? And then I'm going to pay $5 for it on my local uh, TV provider because I don't know why. I'm fucking pumped for this. This is going to be awesome. The 80s were so bad for, like, just production value. Mm -hmm. Like, why couldn't we have put him in a better looking t-shirt? He's supposed to be our hero. He looks grubby as shit. And nowadays people think about the look and the feel of a movie and back then they were just like no 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 we got a script tell the people the story and let's get the fuck out of here it's like they filmed everything in six days as a school project i love the 80s i'm excited for this movie i'm not (laughs) all right so (laughs) well tough shit for you yeah and we're gonna watch it thank you so much matt so we know next week we're watching turner and hooch but what we don't know yet is what we're gonna go see for our new movie Mm, they don't know but we know Exactly, that's some horseshit. We know we are leaving almost immediately after we record. Amazing. We're going to see Doctor Strange. It's a comic book week. It's a We the Nerdy special in the sense that we're finally talking about something that will have other content on the site. I'm so excited for it. Uh, I hope a bunch of the people on the site go see it as well. There should be some other content that you can find online for it. And I'm really, really pumped to go see Doctor Strange uh, in like an hour. Let's do it. I hope that we can sit next to each other and cut holes in the bottom of our popcorn because you know is, what happens at uh, the end. Is Chelsea, is your wife a cumber bitch or a member of oh, the cumber squad? Yeah, yeah, big time. 
I, I we we've got some other friends coming with us to see this movie, and and I texted one of them, and I said, "Do you want to come to this movie?" And he's like, "Yeah, grab me two tickets. The wife is coming too." And I was just like, "Ah, uh, yes, that there's another." What a draw thing. for this movie! Good for them. What what incredible casting to get a whole bunch of fembots out there who uh, not maybe you wouldn't normally come out to to a movie like this. I'm disappointed because I called ahead. I called the theater uh, to ask if they were giving away cummerbunds so that we could all be in character <laughs> and do the little cosplay. They said no. I think it's bullshit. They missed an opportunity, but do you think opening night tonight? Do you think there's going to be cosplay? I think there do should be care a, that much yeah cummerbunds. I think there's going to be cummerbunds aplenty. Well, you know my feeling or on capes. cosplay. You know my feeling on cosplay. I think it's wonderful. I just think you should always do it for the wrong movie. So if we're going to see Doctor Strange, <laughs> I think one of us should go as the Riddler. Oh, I thought you meant like for movies that wouldn't normally get cosplay, like you dressed up as Tom Hanks when you went to see Inferno, and you're just like in pretty normal clothes and just a terrible haircut, and that's it. Nailed it. No, it's all, as I've mentioned on the show before, it's all because I never had more fun than when I was at an opening night for, I think, Harry Potter 4, mm. and someone came dressed as Optimus Prime. That guy's my <laughs> hero. His game is, his cosplay game is tight. I uh, love I was it. on his way to the airport, and he wrote it rode with that costume on a plane to comic con or something like that otherwise there's no explanation for optimus that's prime awesome. and harry potter and you the philosopher's stone that shit takes a lot of effort you gotta you gotta get a use out of that it's like a wedding dress normally you just use it one day exactly so good for him so with that there's your episode 29 coming up next friday we're gonna You're be welcome. talking about dr strange we're gonna be talking about turner and hooch it's gonna be fucking awesome i want to thank everybody who contributed to six degrees to chill again this week we can't thank you guys enough you guys are the best Remember to share and tell your friends about the show. Keep those subscriptions coming in. We're excited to grow this show for you guys. We're going to keep trying new things. We yep. love it. At Gary T Movies on Twitter. At Sean Capri. That's me. Follow the site at We The Nerdy. You can still see us on YouTube at YouTube.com slash We The Nerdy. And, again, go visit the site. Con tons of new content, including, again, this prolific podcaster right here. I just saw put another new episode up of a different podcast yesterday. It's unbelievable. It never stops. Oh, yes. It's a, that one you're referring to is if we run Nintendo, we just basically pretend we run this silly company and it's a lot of fun. Uh, did we, the gamer cast, and that, mo that show is really fun, actually. It's just a lot of like getting to know people from, from the internet, which Absolutely you think great. I'm such an introvert and I hate people. It's weird that I do this show, uh, but it's tons of fun. And what I really want to draw attention to is this weekend. So by the time people are listening to this, I'm going to be gearing up for Extra Life, which is a 24-hour marathon fundraiser for Children's Miracle Network hospitals around the world. I have chosen the Stollery Children's Hospital here in Edmonton. So I will be playing video games on the internet for a full 24 hours. I've got my schedule up on wethenerdy.com, so you can go check that out. There's the links to donate to my page. I'm killing it. I am the number one fundraiser on Team We The Nerdy. We have this crazy, on Twitter, we have a hilarious like 80s 90s wrestling rivalry with the nintendo dads and the mega dads uh it's just hilarious it's been so much fun and and it really just ends up with so much money being raised for the kids so if you need a tax receipt go to my extra life page extra-life.org you can find me there you can find all my stuff on we uh come hang out we're gonna be playing video games all weekend that's it for me gary make your donation fantastic today. job wonderful cause uh excellent job proud of you buddy and can't wait to do the show again with you next week let's go watch some movies bud let's do it okay I um, is it the end i love yeah, you <laughs> <laughs>